Good morning. To all those who uh, have been either snowbirding or off this last week on spring break, and you're not here today, that's fine. We would love to see you. We want you to come here and give us hope next week. Wear your yellow, wear your white, show off your tan, but it will let us know what's coming for us. So please come and see us. Today we are, this is Palm Sunday, and most of us, if, we've, if you've grown up in the church, you've been around the church for a long time, you already know what Palm Sunday is. And we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about it for a second, and then we're gonna, there's an awful lot that happens in the Gospel of Matthew in the last seven days of Jesus' life. And it is very easy, because it's Palm Sunday, to every year talk about and preach on Palm Sunday with Jesus riding in on a colt and the Hosanna and the palm branches and the, the political statement that's made and the messianic statement that's made and Jesus weeping and, and, and cleaning the, clearing the temple, all that stuff. And I'm not, I'm not discounting it at all. But if you look at the gospel according to Matthew, more so than any of the other gospel authors, um, you'll see that Matthew devotes not quite half, but much more time in the, for the last seven days of Jesus' life than any of the other gospel authors. So up to Palm Sunday, 20 chapters. <laughs> and then for the last seven days, and then the resurrection, we've got 21 through 28. So he, he thinks the, the, the passion of Christ, the, the last seven days, Matthew is communicating to us how important it is. And some of the things we miss because we talk about the, the triumphal entry and the clearing of the temple, some of the things we miss are what Jesus is communicating to people that don't yet know how much can happen between two Sundays. They don't yet know that by next Sunday he will be dead. They don't yet know that by next Sunday, he, not only will he have been dead, but he will be raised from the dead. They don't yet know all those things. And Jesus, it, it, it's important to us to think about this, that when, if you know your last days on this earth are here, and Jesus is the only one who knows that, if you know that you have seven days left to live, are you going to speak things that are nonsensical? Are you going to talk about trivial matters? Or are you going to speak to people with one last opportunity to tell them what they need to hear? Think about it this way. If you, God forbid, it's anytime soon for any of us. But if you're on your deathbed and you're completely coherent, and one of your children or grandchildren comes to sit with you as you're dying, and they say, Grandpa, Grandma, is there anything you want me to know? Are you going to go... Mow the lawn better. Make your bed when you get up, because just like you tie your shoes after you take them off, make your bed after you get out of it. Of course not. You're either going to tell them of your great love for them, or if they've been wayward or wandering, or if you've seen some things that you don't love for them, you're going to speak truth to them. You're going to tell them what they need to hear not what they want to hear. And that's exactly what Jesus does during the last seven days of his life. So let me pray, and we'll briefly, I'll just, I'll just summarize the first part of Matthew chapter 21, and then we're going to talk about two parables where Jesus is telling people what they need to hear, but certainly not what they want to hear. And I think maybe some of us need to hear some of these things, whether we want to or not. I know I do. Let's pray. Almighty God, we bless you for who you are, for what you do, for what you've done, and what you promise you will continue doing. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would have us see, hear, and receive. You're telling us very important things because these are the last days that you were walking this earth as one of us. You're, you're going to prepare your disciples, but you're all, also speaking to those who have been given access to your truth and misused it. So, Lord, if there's anything I have planned to say that you don't want said, I do not want to say it. But if there's anything you want said that I haven't thought of in prayer and study, make it clear to me that it's from you, and I will speak it to your people today. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, through the power of your spirit, for the glory of God our Father. 
Amen. So Matthew 21 begins with Jesus, it's a, Jesus sending some disciples in to pick up the, the donkey, right? We've, we've, we've heard this story. And some of the gospel writers talk about a colt and others talk about the colts, uh, the, the, the donkey, the mother. And, and some people are like, are they picturing Jesus like on those, those horse, those, those stunt riders, the horse, the people that do fancy horse work that standing on both of them? I mean, is that how he's going? And what we know is that it's a colt, it's, it's an unbroken colt. So um, the, it's never been ridden before. It doesn't know how to do that. And the people of that time knew that if you have the mother of the colt alongside, the colt is calm. Now, I want to ask you one thing about the donkey or colt, whichever, however, whichever gospel writer you're, you're reading. Um, they're both there. But do you think for one moment that the colt, when all the people are coming to Jesus and all the people are following Jesus, and they're laying their cloaks and palm fronds down, and they're, and they're yelling out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, blesses the one who comes in the name of the Lord. When they're saying, oh, Lord, save us about this man, do you think that that donkey for one minute thought it was about him or her? Of course not. But sometimes in our religiosity, we start thinking that the things of Jesus were primarily about us. Much like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. They thought that the kingdom of God was about them and not about bringing glory to God. But Jesus, when he comes in, uh, the triumphal entry, he goes to the temple. And what does he do at the temple? He tosses tables. And if I'm one of those money changers, I'm going to be upset because that's my livelihood. You know, it's the money exchange, and you get, you get a little percentage. Lynn and I are going to be, we're going uh, to Ireland and then Hungary to work with our church planters in Hungary um, in, a, in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to have to exchange money. Uh, and, and when I exchange that money, the person that gives me, you, or gives me whatever it is, uh, I can't remember what it's called in Hungary, but I know that I spent like 200,000 of them, which is like 30 bucks. Um, but, and that's like, man, I'm a, I'm a millionaire. Um, but they're going to keep a little bit for themselves because they, they are providing a service. So these people in the temple are providing a service. Um, I don't like the spirit of the whole thing, but, but that is what they were doing. So when Jesus flips over their table and throws stuff around, they've got to be upset. But what does Jesus say? My father's house will be called a house of prayer, and you're turning it into a den of robbers. And then he walks back out with his disciples, and he sees a fig tree. And in the Gospel of Matthew, the fig tree dies immediately. I mean, Jesus walks up to it. It's not supposed to be, it's not in season. It's not supposed to be producing figs, but he, it's not, it doesn't give him any figs, and he curses it, and it withers right there. And he's saying something to his disciples, and he's saying something to the people he's going to talk to on Monday or Tuesday. That the people that God has entrusted to be a beacon on a hill, a light to the nations, the people, the, the, the people that God has chosen way back with Abram to represent him and his reign and his kingdom and his glory and his majesty and his mercy and his grace and his hope and his provision to the world have decided to hold it for themselves and not share it with others. Jesus is saying at this point, that time is done. No more. And then he walks up to the Pharisees in the temple courts and, and they say, what, by what authority do you do your teaching? Because they've heard. I guarantee you they've heard. This is Passover. So everybody, all the Jews, that de those who live outside of Jerusalem, those from all over the world, they're there. And so the, these, and there's all this fervor. It says that all of Jerusalem was, was, was kind of riled up because of Jesus' entry. And so Jesus is interacting with the religious leaders of the time. And they say, by whose authority do you speak these things? And Jesus says, I, I'm going to answer your question with a question. I'm going to ask you a question. If you answer my question, I'll answer yours. John's baptism, was it of God or was it of man? They huddle together. If we say it was of God, then he's going to ask, why didn't we believe him? And if we say it's of man, all these people are going to get upset with us. So they, 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 they break their huddle and they come to the line and they get ready for the count. And they say, we don't know. 
And Jesus says, then I'm not, then I'm going to tell you whose authority, whose authority I use. And then he says two things to them, two parables. And they're both very indicting. They don't like it. He's not tickling their ears. But it's the last week of his life. He's got four or five, two or three days left. This is probably on Tuesday morning. And this is what it says. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. By the way, the vineyard is always, vines and vineyards are always a reference to Israel. That's how God described it throughout the ages. Son, go and work, in, uh, go and work today in the vineyard. Nope, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. And then their father went to the other son, said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did his father, what his father wanted? And then they answered, these religious leaders, they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. So this first parable of the two sons is about John the baptizer. But more than that, it's about them. Because you think about it, you have the faithful Jewish people, and you have the faithless. You have the righteous and the unrighteous. You have those that are seeking perfection by following every jot and tittle of the law, and you have those who are quite literally called, it's a class of people, it almost always shows up in Scripture in the New Testament with, with a single quotation around it, you have, you have the people seeking perfection with every jot and tittle of the law, and you have sinners. And the sinners are the ones who the Lord says, this is what I want you to do. And they say, nope. But then they do. And the others are the ones that say, of course, Lord, that's what you put us here to do. We are here to represent your reign on this planet. We are here to speak to the people and tell them who you are and what you require of them. Of course, Lord, we will do your work. And they don't. They decide to make it about them and not about him. So he, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, those in charge of God's presence on this earth, at least they're in charge of, of communicating that to all the people of the earth. God gave a particular people access to the truth and the revelation that comes from God. Who is God and what does he require of us? He gave a certain group of people access to that so that they could share it with the world and they chose to, to huddle up and make it about them. And so Jesus says to them, there are two types of people in the world, the sinners and the righteous. And they're like, yes. But the righteous are the sinners and the sinners are the righteous. No. Soren Kierkegaard, a great existentialist philosopher who turned to Christ later in his life, he says there are two types of people in the world. There's the sinners who think they're righteous, and the righteous who know they're sinners. So I have to ask, because these are important words from Jesus, in the last days of his life on this earth, which are you? Which are we? Because the last line here, Jesus says, For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. He says that the sinners and the prostitutes, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, are going to enter the kingdom before them. What about us? I mean, let's just be honest. When's the last time you really felt compelled to repent? I don't mean to say you're sorry. I don't mean to feel bad or guilty about something you said, did, didn't do, didn't say. 
I'm not, I'm not talking about going to your spouse after you snapped at him or her and saying, I'm, I'm, that was a jerk, I'm sorry. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about fall to your knees, grab the dirt kind of moment where you're like, who am I, Lord? Look what I've done. Look who I am. And you are a holy God. Why are you even mindful of me? Because I keep messing it up. God, as far as it depends on me, no more of this. From this point forward, I am yours. And I will do everything I can to obey every command you've given me. When's the last time we did that? When's the last time we felt the need for grace? Because these folks believed they had it. They believed that they were in charge. They believed that they were being faithful to God. They believed that they could actually appease a deity. And Jesus, God in flesh, with three days left in his life, says to them, prostitutes and tax collectors are getting in before you. He's not tickling their ears. And then he goes on. First he talks about John the baptizer and, and the, the call to repentance. <laughs> And then it gets ugly. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a wine press in it. And he built a watchtower. So he's describing something they all know well. Now the small little vineyards where someone has a little plot. They have a, an acre or maybe a couple of acres. They don't have watchtowers because you can stand on your porch and look out and see your whole vineyard. He's talking about something massive. Where people, they, 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 in order to keep... Thieves and vermin out, you build a tall stone wall, and because it's so vast, it's so big, it's so majestic, you have to build a watchtower so you can, you can get up high and see across all that the landowner owns. They know it. He knows it. And then this builder of this vineyard, he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. It belongs to him, and their rent is part of the harvest. Now, you, you, you see this. I know you see this. We all see this. God is the vineyard owner. God is the vineyard builder. God is the one who entrusted all the fruit that he's going to produce on this earth to a particular group of people. He wanted us to tell the world who he is. He wanted us to share the bounty of God's grace with all the people on the planet. He wanted us. To say, come to the father. Because he's good. The tenants. He sent, his, he sent his servants to collect his tenants, or to collect to the tenants to collect his fruit. And the tenants sieved his servants. They beat one, they killed another, stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They'll respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? Eesh. Now we know that Jesus means himself. He's the son. We know that the, that the, the servants are the prophets of old. Those And the judges, those who came to say, uh-uh, folks, we're messing up. It's time to repent. Tear your clothes. Put some ash on your face. Fall to your knees and ask God to forgive. And we know that John the baptizer was one of the last ones. He was, he was Elijah for all intents and purposes. And they cut off his head. And so here's the son of the landowner. Here's the son of of the one who owns the earth. Here's the son of God who is speaking to the people that were supposed to be the managers of the vineyard, producing fruit for God. And he says, this is what you've done. 
you've misused the land and you've killed all the servants and you're about to kill me. Why? Because they are, and I'm going to use a word, it's not a swear word, but it almost sounds like one. Because they have become usufructors. A usufructor is someone who uses the property of someone else as if it's their own. They pretend that it's theirs and that the owner, the rightful owner, has no right to it. That's a legal term, but that's what they're doing. And I'm, I'm fearful that we do too. And I'm not saying that we misuse this building, but think about it for a moment. If the scripture tells us, if we believe that God is who he claimed to be, and, and the revelation of scripture, that it means what it meant, and that Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey what I command, and he tells others, and other times he says, you, you, you're righteous if you obey everything I've commanded you. But then we don't like sometimes what he says. I don't like what he says about money. I mean, just after this, just a couple, just within the, the next, the very next chapter, Jesus talks about giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but he says, give to God what belongs to God. Whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. Whose image is on you? Me? God's image. He's not, he's not talking just about money. He's talking about that, that, that everything that I am belongs to God. Everything that I have belongs to God. And he's saying that to, the, to, to these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these teachers of the law. He's, he cares about them enough to tell them the truth. He doesn't want them to, to lose salvation. He doesn't want them to walk away and find judgment instead of forgiveness. And he says this to them. And he, he goes, what, what do you think the father's going to do? To those tenants. And then they answer, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. They just pronounce their own sentence. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. This, folks, is the religious Jewish leaders talking about the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures, read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them, and they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. I don't like one thing in here, but I'm glad he cared enough about us to tell us the stakes. So, We've got six minutes and 28 seconds left. I'm probably not going to spend all that time. But I'm just going to ask. I've got some in my head. I've got some plan. It might be a little uh, by the spirit here. But how many of us feel like we deserve God's faithfulness? Do I feel entitled to grace? And what I mean by that is do I feel like I'm good enough to have it? Do I feel like I've kind of got the God thing taken care of and those people? Because when I read this, I'm like, yeah, Lord, you give them, give them what for. But I am them. We are them. So what is he calling us to repent of? Because he says to them, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to those who will produce fruit. I don't believe that we can lose our salvation. I don't. But I do believe there are times in each of our lives, multiple times, when we get used to being religious and therefore stop being faithful. And each of those times, 
God will approach us through his word, through prayer, or through the hard but beautiful words of a friend. And he will say to us, nicer terms than this, but who do you think you are? And I want to be able to say, I'm a child of the Most High God. But that's not always how I've been behaving. I've been behaving like I've got this thing settled and God needs to get to them. See, there are two types of people in the world. The righteous people who know they're sinners and the sinners who think they're righteous. Which one are you? I can't answer that. It's not an accusation. But I cannot read these parables and not believe that Jesus meant them. He's got three days left. And he's telling people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. So what do you need to hear from God? To lighten it up for a minute, 1989, January, I was in Philadelphia taking a grad school class. Chris Peters and I were, were roommates. We were both on Young Life staff. And a guy stood up, I don't remember his first name, he was one of the professors, but he started tell, talking about a, a guy that he really respected who was from Africa, and they had been, he, I don't remember how they, how they got to know each other, but, but he, the guy that was one of the professors, he had said to this friend, he said, you know, I just feel like I'm kind of stagnant, I'm kind of stuck in my faith journey, I'm not really growing, I've just kind of, kind of got the knowledge that I have, and I'm walking, I'm praying, I'm being, trying to be faithful, but you know, it's just, I'm just kind of stagnant. And the guy goes, well, repent. He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sinning. I'm just, I'm just kind of stuck. Repent. <sighs> okay, what? Anytime we're not experiencing, and I don't just mean emotional feeling. I mean walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Anytime that we're stagnant, anytime that we're stuck, anytime that we're angry or bitter, anytime that, we're, that, that, that we've been disillusioned or we've been betrayed or we've been harmed or we've, been, or we've, we, we've had to eat somebody else's sin and we're just, anytime. The call is the same as John and the call is the same of Jesus. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. And believe. And what does it mean to believe the words of Jesus? To do the words of Jesus. To walk the steps of Jesus. To be like the one who saved us. This is the first day of Holy Week and we celebrate it and we should. But what are we celebrating? We're celebrating the fact that the God of the universe was so unimpressed with our ability to manage his kingdom that he came and let us kill him so he could forgive us for what we haven't done and for what we have. That's one of his best friends sells him out with a kiss and he let him. The God of the universe loves you so much. He will not let you die without the opportunity to repent. So I'm going to pray for you this week and me. I'm doing a lengthy fast this week for you. I'm going to be praying that some of us have those grab the dirt moments. That if God has something to say to us, we will hear him. That we will not be the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the teachers of the law who think we got it. That we will not become or continue to be the people that would have killed Jesus. I'm going to pray that in a wonderful, glorious, and awful way, Jesus gets to you this week. So that when you come on Maundy Thursday and we celebrate the Last Supper together, it means something. And so that next week when you come at Easter and you hear a gospel presentation from Adam to the resurrection, you go, oh, I needed that. Not that's good for other people. I'm going to pray that you and I each have a moment like Oswald Chambers, 
Mr. Chambers, when did you become a Christian? And his response was, you mean the first time? Because we have to become Christians every single day. Let's pray. Lord, you know I sat down at the beginning of the service and I said to, I said to Pastor Kurt, when am I going to get a scripture passage that's not hard? You know I love these people. And I know you love these people. And if you loved the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, and we know you did, you were willing to tell them what they needed to hear. And you want to tell us the same things. So, Lord, this week, as we celebrate your death, which sounds such a weird thing to say, as we celebrate your sacrifice, as we celebrate the Passion Week of the Son of God, let it matter to each one of us. And, Lord, each one of us, as we need it, give us one of those on the floor, grab the carpet, grab the dirt moments, so that we have a right spirit renewed in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.